Today, we will look at the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s. We will look at the assault on Jim Crow that started at the Supreme Court with the Brown versus the Board of Education case, and the response in many southern states. We will consider the bus boycott in Montgomery and its leader, a young preacher named Martin Luther King, who would emerge as the face of the movement, one dominated by nonviolent, but by nonviolent tactics like sit-ins, protests, and marches. We will see the end of Jim Crow through acts of Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we will close by looking at the frustrations for some African Americans, even after these successes, through Malcolm X. It's the Civil Rights Movement. Let's go back to 1896, when the Supreme Court ruled against Homer Plessy in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. It was this case where the Supreme Court ruled that segregated facilities were legal as long as they were separate but equal. This meant that there could be separate water fountains, restroom, entrances to restaurants, baseball fields, and schools. It was the Plessy case that ushered in the Jim Crow era and led many African Americans to flee the South into the North to escape Jim Crow and to find jobs. And after World War II, many African Americans thought they would return home to a more equal society after helping defeat fascism in Asia and Europe, but they did not. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, which W.B. Du Bois played a role in founding in 1909, led a legal campaign to end segregation. They focused their attention on ending segregation of public schools, where ten times more money was spent on white schools than black schools. The NAACP argued that the, the segregated public schools were a violation of the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the laws. It was the NAACP effort that provided the lawyers that would eventually lead to the Brown case. The NAACP effort was led by Thurgood Marshall. Marshall would, la would later be appointed by Lyndon Johnson as the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court. It was Marshall who won a series of victories that would lead to the ending of the separate but equal precedent laid down in Plessy v. Ferguson. In the Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in May 1954 case marked a major victory for the civil rights movement. In this case, Thurgood Marshall challenged school segregation and won. Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, ruled that separate facilities were inherently unequal and a violation of the 14th Amendment. Warren ruled that schools must be integrated with all deliberate speed. It was the Brown case that overturned the precedent laid forth in Plessy v. Ferguson. It's also worth noting that the NAACP effort in, in Virginia to overturn school segregation was led by Oliver Hill. The Supreme Court did not state that schools needed to be integrated immediately or even in the near future, but again, with all deliberate speeds. And in some states, Officials moved very quickly to enforce the ruling, while in other states like Virginia, they were, they were resistant. In Virginia, there was massive resistance in places like Norfolk and Warren County, which meant that schools were closed to avoid inter integration. Individuals living in these areas would rather have no schools than schools where white and black children went, to, went together. There were private academies established. Public schools have the ability, or private schools have the ability to accept whomever they want. So you might guess the racial makeup of these private schools. And there was white flight. White families just left urban areas and moved to areas where they could avoid integrated schools. The most infamous event in this fight took place in Little Rock, Arkansas, where nine African-American students attempted to roll, enroll at Central High School, which had been a white high school in Little Rock. Governor Orville Faubus had used the National Guard to prevent the students from entering the school. In response, President Eisenhower ordered the 101st Airborne to accompany the Little Rock Nine, as they came to be known, to school and protect them during the day. So in Little Rock, you had the 101st Airborne helping integrate schools. The next year, Faubus ordered all public schools to close, and the people voted to accept the governor's decision. The people of Little Rock would, ra would rather have no public schools than have schools where white and black students attended together. Many African Americans were frustrated with the slow pace of change in the South. The segregation of public transportation was another source of frustration. And when Rosa Parks decided not to move to the back of the bus, as was expected, she was arrested. And her arrest sparked a massive African American bus boycott against riding city buses in Montgomery. Martin Luther King, who was a minister of a local church, 
emerged as the leader of the boycott and established himself as, the, as a leading voice in the civil rights movement. African Americans refused to ride the bus for more than a year, walking and carpooling, and this severely hurt the bus lines in Montgomery. And the Montgomery bus boycott ended in 1956 when the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public transportation was unconstitutional, another victory for civil rights. King and his followers practiced civil disobedience. This nonviolent protest included boycotts, sit-ins, and marches. Sit-ins at lunch counters, starting in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960, involved African Americans sitting at lunch counters, which were for white patrons. They would sit and endure what you see in the picture there. People would dump food and drink on them while, while yelling and causing a scene. These activists would eventually be arrested for disturbing the peace. But the visual of this type of protest would be effective over time. In 1961, freedom rides involved white and black activists riding on interstate buses to challenge the segregation of buses, restrooms, and restaurants in the South. These freedom riders faced violence along the way. They were oftentimes beaten and the buses set on fire, as you can see in the picture there. But eventually, the Interstate Commerce Commission ordered that all interstate vehicles and terminals be desegregated. In places like Selma and Birmingham, Alabama, marches and protests were held to bring attention to the plight of African Americans in the South. Oftentimes, these tactics were used to invoke a reaction from city officials. One of the most infamous examples was Bull Connor, the, the Commissioner of Public Safety in Birmingham, Alabama. King led Project C in Birmingham against tactics the police used against African Americans. The pictures here show police turning attack dogs and fire hoses on the protesters. Many people viewed these actions on TV and watched as protesters did not fight back in the face of brutal tactics. This was civil disobedience. These individuals started to pay more attention to the civil rights movement. And in 1963, Martin Luther King led the March on Washington, where more than 250,000 people crowded the mall with the statue of Abraham Lincoln overseeing the proceedings. The goal was to demand the passage of a civil rights bill. It was here on August 28, 1963, that Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, as King said that day. Many people saw this, mar saw this march. They saw black and white Americans peacefully protesting for civil rights and changed their opinion regarding a civil rights bill. The March on Washington demonstrated the power of nonviolent mass protests. And in 1964, there would be a civil rights bill. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal to discriminate against anyone based on race, religion, national origin, or gender. So this was not just a victory for African Americans. The law desegregated all public accommodations. Jim Crow was dead. The bill was passed through Congress by President Johnson, who used the death of, Je of John F. Kennedy months earlier to gain support for the bill. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 marked a high point for the civil rights movement. And in 1965, following violence against voting rights marches in Selma, Alabama, led by Martin Luther King, Congress moved to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The act outlawed literacy tests and provided federal officials to go into the South to register African Americans to vote. This led to dramatic increases in African American voting throughout the South, especially in the deep, deep South, as the chart here shows. In Alabama, the percentage of African Americans voting increased from 23% in 1964 to 57% in 1968 in the state of Alabama. And in Mississippi, the change was even more dramatic. The percentage who voted in, in 1964 was only 6.7%. The number in 1968 was 54%. This dramatically changed voting patterns in the South. And Lyndon Johnson also played a role in getting this bill passed in Congress. As the civil rights movement continued, many young African Americans lost patience with the slow progress and little change they saw in their lives. Even with the legislative victories, there were riots in many northern cities after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. As a result of a lack of economic activity, opportunities, housing, and education. And while discrimination had been barred legally, there still was discrimination in fact. Malcolm Little converted to the Nation of Islam, an organization led by, 
my Elijah Muhammad that called for black nationalism, separatism, and self-improvement. Malcolm Little would change his name to Malcolm X and would emerge as a leader of the nature of nature, the nation of Islam and became a harsh critic of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Malcolm X referred to Martin Luther King as an Uncle Tom, one subservient to whites. Malcolm X advocated meeting violence with violence. He advocated that our African Americans had a right to defend themselves against white violence and should not practice the nonviolent tactics practiced by Martin Luther King. And let's close the show by looking at the premature deaths of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and the end of the civil rights movement. On the 1963 March on Washington, Malcolm X said it was run by whites in front of a statue of a president who has been dead for a hundred years and who didn't like it when he was alive. Of course, Malcolm X is speaking of President Abraham Lincoln. The views of Malcolm X softened, softened over time, especially after he returned from his pilgrimage to Mecca. He started talking about biracial solutions to racial issues after breaking from the nation of Islam. But before these views could be put into practice, a man called Malcolm was assassinated in 1965 by members of the Nation of Islam. And three years later, in 1968, at a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King was gunned down by an assassin. In response to the death of the most important leader of the civil rights movement, who had preached civil disobedience, nonviolence, there were riots in over a hundred cities, just what Dr. King would not have wanted his followers to do. We'll look at the recent past next time, and until then, good night, Albuquerque.